and welcome everybody. Uh, thank you for logging on today and uh, and and and, uh, and and for your attention. Uh, we want to present some preliminary uh, findings after uh, two two months following the the September 19th earthquake in uh, in Mexico. And uh, we have uh, lined up a series of speakers, including uh, uh, including uh, people that participated in reconnaissance missions uh, from here in the U.S. as well as uh, speakers from uh, from Mexico. Some of our collaborators that we work work with there. Um, to get started and provide an introduction, we'll have uh, Lucia Aran from San Over College um, uh, that worked on this presentation along, along with myself. Um, and uh, if we could please uh, move on to, to the first presentation. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the Mexico Earthquake Reconnaissance Briefing. My name is Lucy Arndt, and along with Gilberto Mosquedo, we are the two EERI Reconnaissance co-leads, and I am going to be setting up today's webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. First, let me do a very quick overview about EERI's response to the earthquake in Mexico, specifically with special focus on the September 19th, 2017 earthquake. So uh, immediately, uh, EERI staff undertook a number of measures. They launched a new virtual clearinghouse website to support information sharing. That included improved resource library, data map, and photo gallery. We'll be showing a very quick peek at those in just a bit. Uh, EERI staff served in a coordination role to support collaboration among more than 20 international and U.S. reconnaissance teams. So rather than sending its own very large team to Mexico, EERI decided to step into this coordination role where there were several regular coordination calls. All of these different teams were invited to participate and share uh, their information. We also had in the field team meetings where we were able to coordinate across all of these teams. There was a topic fo focused team on earthquake early warning that was deployed in early October, along with two reconnaissance co-leads, myself again and Gilberto Mosqueda. The two of us went to Mexico City in early October. And then uh, I think very importantly, EERI activated its virtual earthquake reconnaissance team. So as I mentioned, uh, EERI staff put together this virtual earthquake clearinghouse website. And of course, we want to encourage you to go to this website to check out the many resources that are available on this earthquake. You will see, for example, data map, reconnaissance photo gallery. Let me just give you another peek at this information on another slide. Data map, as you'll see here. And then also photo gallery. So here is where people from various teams have uploaded their photos. So again, you can get a really good sense of what's happening, what's available, what kind of intel has been gathered. I want to take you back to this link. So www.learningfromearthquakes.org. And then you see there the connection for the information on this Puebla earthquake. Going forward, uh, it was mentioned already that there were a number of reconnaissance teams that went to Mexico that EERI helped to coordinate. And what I mean by that is, again, we had these coordination calls where teams were invited to share where they were going and in the aftermath where they had been, what they were planning to study, and in the aftermath what they actually discovered. Also sharing even simple logistics information, for example, where people were staying in terms of hotels, uh, what they were finding in terms of access to different uh, damaged building sites, et cetera. And as you can see from this slide, again, a wide variety of teams with a variety of interests, some of which were structural, some of which were geotechnical, some of which were early earthquake warning systems, some more social science. Again, lots of terrific information sharing. On that virtual earthquake reconnaissance team, I can't, I can't tell you enough how important this group's efforts are in terms of supporting all of the work being done by the various teams that are in the field. So what these folks do is they are out online looking for information relative, relevant, excuse me, to this earthquake, trying to pull together uh, information that will be useful to teams in the field, information that will be useful to anyone uh, conducting research on this earthquake, trying to understand better uh, what, what happened as a result of the earthquake and then consequences going forward. So I do want to give a shout out to both Erica and Manny, who co-chair this incredibly important effort. Please uh, make note of the names that you see on the screen and 
as you uh, see these people, as you run into these people, please thank them for their hard work on EERI's behalf. It is incredibly important. We also need to acknowledge uh, the generous support of our folks, our colleagues in Mexico. So we've got a number of organizations listed here, SMIS, uh, SMIE, UNAM, uh, UAM, AZ, the 100 Resilient Cities Office, uh, the individuals associated with these different organizations who honestly, without them, there's no way that we could have done what we were able to do in such a short time in the field. Uh, Sergio Al Alcocer, he is with UNAM, Luciano Fernandez, uh, with SMI and UAM, uh, David de Leon, um, Arturo Tena Colunga, uh, David Muria, Gustavo Ayala, Eduardo Reynoso, y Arnoldo Matus Kramer with uh, 100 Resilient Cities. Of course, there are many other individuals. I wish we had time to call out each person and thank them. But as I'm sure you all recognize, any, any reconnaissance effort requires not only people from different organizations and associations going to that country, but absolutely critically, those folks who are in country, in the field, who enable us to make contacts so that we can not only observe building damage, Image, but they were also able to talk with people to discover what's been going on and what requires additional research. Thank you again for joining this webinar. I'm going to stop talking here and let the next person step in. Thank you. Uh, so for, first, thank you, Lucy, for that uh, presentation. So uh, maybe uh, we had a similar issue. I did not see the first slide, and uh, so Lucy was going to present uh, her and, and, my, and myself, which were selected as the ER reconnaissance colleagues for. Uh, for this uh, Mex Mexico earthquake uh, reconnaissance effort. Um, I want to go over the, the rest of the agenda for, for the day. Uh, we'll start first with the presentation on the earthquake overview and response by uh, Luciano Fernandez. We're very uh, fortunate to have uh, Lu Luciano here today. Um, I think this presentation was originally scheduled to be given by Sergio Alcocer. Unfortunately, he was not able to make it. Um, however, uh, again, we're very fortunate to have Luciano um, as he was one one of the um, one of the lead coordinators of uh, of a lot of the data collection efforts that happened in Mexico through the Colegio de Ingenieros that we probably all have heard of. Um, following uh, Luciano, we have uh, Tara Hutchinson from UC San, San Diego speaking on the geotechnical impacts. Then uh, Richard Allen from UC Berkeley on the early earthquake uh, early warning system, and then uh, Luciano Fernandez again on the the structural uh, impacts. Uh, we'll, we'll also see a presentation on lifelines by Erica Fisher from Oregon State University. And then we'll close up with uh, a discussion of, of potential reconnaissance gaps by, uh, again, by Lucia Ren and, and uh, myself. Um, and we'll have time, if there's uh, time at the end of the present, at, at the end of the presentations, we could take some, uh, some questions from the audience. Uh, so next, uh, the next speaker on the agenda then is uh, the second presentation by uh, Luciano uh, Fernandez uh, from uh, fr from Juan in uh, in Mexico City. Thank you, Gilberto, and thank you for the ERI people for for the invitation to join this webinar. So, in this first presentation, I want to talk about an a little overview about the earthquake and some response actions that we performed here in Mexico. So, oh, sorry. So, well, the content of the presentation is this one. I'm not going to spend a lot of time here. So I just want to show you some general data of the earthquake. The earthquake was a magnitude of 7.1 and uh, the epicenter was near the limit of the states of Puebla and Morelos. You can see in that chart, uh, where is the epicenter? and how are the PGAs from different parts. The red ones are the largest PGAs and then the, the green ones are lower PGAs. Uh, the earthquake was at 13 hours of local time and it has a 57 kilometers deep. It was an intraslab uh, earthquake, not very common to have so large intraslab earthquakes in, in Mexico. And the most important, I believe, uh, characteristic, it was a very near earthquake, a one, about 120 kilometers from Mexico City. 
since this was an intra-slab uh, earthquake, we haven't had a lot of aftershocks, only 39 aftershocks from this earthquake. So uh, since the earthquake was near the center of the country, we have a lot of people and a lot of infrastructure in this zone. The level of exposure of this earthquake was around 22 million, no, 32 million people. And we had allowed uh, about 9 million houses, uh, something about 5,000 uh, health cares, 54,000 schools, and a lot of people was expo exposed for this for this air earthquake, mainly on the center part of the of the country. So this is a very different earthquake than the one that we had in 85. You can see in this chart the spectral acceleration on the Mexico City Valley for the 85 earthquake and for the 2017 earthquake. And you can see that the earthquake of this year has larger spectral accelerations for short period uh, structures, about, about one second period. In difference of the 85 earthquake, since that earthquake was a subduction earthquake far from the city, it had more spectral acceleration from structure of two seconds. So it was a very different picture. And that's why we had uh, some damage in places that we didn't think, and we didn't have uh, damage in places that we were uh, expecting damage. Uh, here in this chart, you can see the distribution of damage in, in both earthquakes. You can see again how for 85 earthquake, we have uh, damage on the lake bed zone with uh, deep uh, deposits of clay. And in this earthquake, the damage was more in a stiffer soil zone with different periods of the, of the soil. So this picture, I believe that shows very good how different was the damage distribution in, in these two earthquakes. But one thing that is very interesting is that if this was our design earthquake, so this chart shows the uniform hazard earthquake for a 250 years return period. That's the dotted line for a, a intra-slab uh, earthquake. And if you can see, the blue line is the elastic spectrum of the rock si site soil. And you can see that it matches uh, almost the uniform hazard spectrum. So we can say that it was, it was, it was our, our design earthquake, especially for structures beneath one second of natural period. Um, about casualties, uh, in the Mexico City, we have uh, reported 228 casualties. But the interesting part here is that from those 200 casualties, about 25% was concentrated on just one building, Alvaro Obregón 285. Then uh, on Colegio Repsamen, uh, elementary school, we had 25, 26 uh, people that died. And in other five buildings, we have around 10 to 15 people that have lost their lives in those buildings. So we have uh, very, very concentrated the, the people who, who lost their lives in, in, no, uh, in, no, in some buildings. So moving on to the response actions, I have to say that there were uh, several institutions that spread recognition teams on, on the field. Uh, there were teams from the Department of Civil Protection, from the city government, CEDUBI, that is the Housing and Urban Agency from the city government, CENAPRED, that is the National Center of Disaster Prevention, uh, the effort of Colegio de Ingenieros Civil, Civiles, SMI and SMIG, that are the engineering societies, but as well as the engineering societies, the architect societies spread teams on, on the field, and some engineering and architecture schools. Um, it is important to point out that all teams use the same quick form. This quick form, it, it's in Spanish, I'm sorry, but this was the, the form that we all use. And this form has, uh, it's very quick, it's very easy to fill. 
it has some personal data about the, the person that it's taking the information, some data about the building, address, number of stories, use, number of people, the type of damage that was uh, observed, if there was a total collapse, partial collapse, it, it has a lot of settlement or differential settlement. If buildings have had a lot of tilting, some structural damage, and another type of hazards such as gas leaks or ground failures uh, can be reported on this form. And the most important part of this form is that the structure classification has only two classifications a high risk structure or a low risk structure. Uh, the structure was classified as, as high risk if there was any structural damage or severe non-structural damage, or even if we had environmental dangers such as gas leak. So this was a high risk structure. In the other part, we had low risk structures with uh, no large uh, non-structural damage. And if there was not enough information, we classified the structures as uncertain risk. So from the part of the engineering societies, we respond right the day of the, of the earthquake, then September 19th, we had a coordination meeting to set a general plan of action. Then on September 20th, the city was divided on 50 zones. This work was done by Professor Eduardo Miranda that was here in Mexico, uh, Professor Sergio Alcocer, uh, the engineer Francisco Garcia Alvarez that is the president of Mexican Society of Structural Engineers, and Dr. Renato Berron from the city government. And then on the same day on the, of the evening, we have a meeting with senior structural engineers, with structural engineers and with some students of civil engineering to set the teams. The teams were set with one leader that was the senior structural engineer, two sub-leaders that were uh, structural engineers, and then to 10 to 15 supports, uh, mainly students of, of civil engineer. And with this uh, scheme, we set 30 teams, and these 30 teams covered 161 square kilometers. A lot of, of field was covered with these teams. And this recognition effort was done from September 21 to October 10th, more or less, with the field uh, in the field work. And a very important part was the support of foreign teams, teams from Colombia, for, from Venezuela, from Chile, from the United States through ERI organization, from New Zealand, from France, from Canada, and there are still uh, teams from other countries coming to Mexico. So. For the actions that we took on this uh, effort, the first action was to identify all our teams. So we uh, give them ID badges for all the teams uh, given by the Colegio de Ingenieros Civiles. We established contact with the local government, with di the different delegaciones that are the local governments uh, in the city. Uh, we perform, we develop a digital evaluation form in Google Docs, and we develop uh, some interactive maps, in, especially for the teams on the field to have a, very, a better understanding of, of what was going on. We set a clearing house and a crisis center on the Colegio, and all field teams had a direct contact with the crisis center through a WhatsApp uh, group for any help needed. So this, this organization was very efficient in order to help people on the field. So this effort has had different goals. The immediate goals were to, was to help Mexico City government on the identification of damaged buildings, but also to help the society to keep calm and to have some certainty about the security of their houses. There was a lot of fear on the people and the teams were able to, to calm the people and to establish if there was a very uh, dangerous damage on the, on the building or there was no dangerous damage on the building. And we, we, we want to gather some information about the performance and damage of buildings and of lifelines. In a short term, we are developing a general database about the earthquake effects on the Mexico City infrastructure. We are developing a digital tool to analyze all the information, including the effects of past earthquakes the 57, the 79, and the 85 earthquakes. 
and we are identifying research areas in order to increase the structural safety and resilience of our cities. And this effort, uh, it's, it has been very, very hard. Uh, in a mid-term goal, we have to set a response protocol with participation of all relevant institutions and with the coordination with all the institutions. You saw that we had a lot of teams on the field, so we have to coordinate all the institutions and not only the engineering societies. And we have to develop a unique set of digital tools for collect and analyze all the information from the recognized teams because if it's very difficult to consolidate all the information if, the, if it is in different formats and in different forms. So uh, to end this part of the presentation, I want to make some um, comments about what I think that we did well. I think that we had a very short response time. I think that we could set a high level of expertise on the field teams. The identification badges were very important to get into the in different places. The coordination through WhatsApp groups was very efficient. It, this is, it, it looks like a silly conclusion, but believe me, that was a very important part of the, of the effort. The support of the crisis center staff on different field problems was very important. The organization of the help of, from foreign teams, such as the teams coming from the States, has been very, very efficient and very important and the development of interactive tools have facilitated the field work. But we have to improve a lot of things. The, the first one is we have to have a better coordination between different institutions. Some buildings were inspected by too many teams, up to six teams, and that was a problem because people was tired about, about teams going there and, and seeing their buildings. We need a well-set and well-known response protocol that everybody knows and everybody ha uh, everybody has the idea of what is going on. The field teams must be joined by a government agent which, which can take decisions because in sometimes people want us to tell them what to do and we just can give them a recommendation but we cannot take decisions. So we need the government uh, to take those decisions. We need a clear tax system. Some teams define the uncertain risk level as yellow, if, if, like if it was modern damage, but it was not modern damage, it was a different thing. And we need more experts on damage recognition. So I would like to acknowledge all the people which participate on the recognition teams, the structural engineers and students, to Professor Sergio Alcocer for giving a great portion of the information used in this presentation and especially all the teams from the other countries that help and are still helping, like all the people from ERI on the rec recognizes efforts. So thank you very much. If you have further questions, here is my email and you can check a lot of information on this website, sismosmexico.org. Thank you very much. Thank you, Luciano, for uh, that, that presentation. And I'm glad to hear from you that, that there was a lot of international teams that, that helped. And uh, I think a lot of international teams um, were greatly um, supported by, by the colleagues as well in planning their visits to, to Mexico. Um, next, we have on the agenda a presentation on geotechnical impacts, and that will be presented by uh, Professor uh, Tara Hutchinson from the University of California, San Diego, and also uh, a member of the GEAR team uh, that, um, that visit a, a, a Mexico. Okay, um, thank you, Roberto. Thank you very much uh, uh, to EERI for hosting this important web webinar and to the audience, of course, for making some time to attend. Um, uh, as, as, you, as you know, my name is Tara Hutchinson. I'm here at the University of California, San Diego, um, a professor in the structural engineering department. However, I'm a, a small face in a large picture of many talented colleagues um, that were fortunate to, de to develop a, a collaboration with UNAM researchers and other international partners as a part of uh, what we'll refer to as a, as a UNAM gear uh, team reconnaissance effort to document the geotechnical features of this event. Um, Given the prominence and size of this event, um, 
gear supported a two-phase re reconnaissance um, effort immediately after the September 19th event. First, an advanced team um, uh, spent about five days on the ground shortly after, uh, shortly after the main shock. It subsequently laid the groundwork for a main team to inter interrogate further sites and, and broaden their visits. Um, critical to this effort was the local support and collaboration led by UNAM Professor Juan Mayorel, um, uh, Professor Kevin Franke of BYU led the advance team and I led um, the main team. As well as in um, the spirit of all past gear reconnaissance effort um, the importance of having the steering committee and and other on-ground U.S. Um, uh, uh, support was offered, in this case by Professor John Bray, Ellen Rathje, uh, Fernando Garcia, and others. I should um, wanted to take a point here and plug the fact that um, Gear was able to release a first version of its report. Um, and you can find that on the GearAssociation.org webpage. This map on the right shows the tracks of uh, the two teams. Um, so you can see that uh, the team's work not only encapsulated Mexico City uh, and, and, and the outskirt regions, but as well the states of Morales and Puebla. Uh, just certainly want to acknowledge the support of UNAM, as well as Luciano Sola and his team, Gustavo Ayala, and others, as, as many have said already, um, so critical to have talented and excellent um, colleagues to engage and support their need to document perishable data. And so it was a pleasure to work with Juan and his students and local colleagues in this effort. Uh, uh, just to make sure we recognize our advanced team, we'll call them maybe the scouts in the effort led by Professor Kevin Franke, also brought in colleagues um, from Chile, um, uh, Mark Yashinsky from Caltrans, as well as um, industry professionals, Professor, uh, Dr. Jorge Meneses, um, other colleagues from Southern California and Lemnitzer, uh, Alejandro Martinez um, and Chadi Motar from Austin. Our larger main team, um, which I was had the pleasure to lead, uh, uh, brought researchers as well from the U.S. and Chile, um, with uh, the support of Pedro Arduino, Dominique Asimaki, Gabriel Candia, Jake Daphne, Shade Dashti, uh, Eric Lowe, and Dominique Meyer um, here from UCSD, Jack Montgomery, Alessandro Morales, um, Menzer Levan, and Clint Wood. So I think. Um, with the talent of these, these, these two large teams, we made quite, uh, uh, quite a contribution, I believe, uh, trying to enrich the data set regarding um, the, knowledge of, the knowledge of the sites that were impacted from this event. In particular, the team performed more than 40 tests in the greater city of, greater region of Mexico City, Puebla, the states of Puebla and Morales through both surface wave and um, a low amplitude H over V seismic testing. As well, we brought with us um, four unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, carried these throughout the reconnaissance with one LIDAR unit for high resolution point cloud based scanning. We surveyed over 30 sites, collected more than 300 gigabytes of data and more than 10,000 images, at least by my current count. Um, the, the goal with utilizing some of this type of technology was to generate you know, web-based content that was nav navigatable by others, both through point, point clouds and texture maps and rendered models, and as well to deposit and collect um, <clears throat> and disseminate 3D video content. Um, one final utility, of UAV collected images. I think it's kind of nice uh, to have immediately and at the state of time orthorectified images to allow the generation of damage maps. And I'll show a few of those that we've produced at the end of the, the discussion. So 
So Mexico City and its surroundings are located within an old basin, as we all know. It's comprised of um, two former lake beds, the Texcomo and Cochimil Chalco lakes. Um, these, these lakes have largely disappeared um, due to both under, underground water extraction and land reclamation as the urban environment expands. So while the peripheral part of the city is underlain by rock and hard soil deposits, um, it, and the shear wave velocities of those sites are on the order of 450 to 600 meters per second or so. The central part of the city is complicated um, through the deposit of soft lacustrian clay deposits. And they, they vary in thickness depending on where one is within, um, within the city, of course. The Cochimil Chauco lake clays are a little bit stiffer than the Texcoco, Texcoco Lake clays. However, nonetheless, this large regional deposit of both northern and southern and southern clays has, has plagued the community for many years. Um, as a result, of course, Mexico City has been divided into three main zones, let's say geo-seismic zones within local building codes. This is a map um, remapped from the 2004 building code prov provisions, which articulate um, a, a delineation between the hilly zones on the peripheral, the transitionary zones in the orange as one approaches the lake sediments, and three layers of lakes, uh, four layers of lake zones denoted A, B, C, D, um, to account for the increasing depth of clay deposits when moving from the hilly regions towards the central regions of the original uh, lake beds. A typical soil profile for zone three lake zone soils are shown here. Um, it includes um, nominally a desiccated, a, a shallow desiccated uh, crust, perhaps on the order of one to two meters, but most importantly, an underlain soft to very soft clay layer that's approximately 25 to 35 meters thick with thin interbedded lenses of sands, sandy silt, silty sands. The underlying upper soft clay, uh, underlying the upper soft clay is a layer of very dense sand silt, usually on the order of four to seven meters thick. Um, this in turn rests on a stiff, stiffer clay deposit which can range in thickness, has been shown to range in thickness between 50 to 60 meters. Finally, um, a lower stiff clay is commonly found and denoted to be the most competent, of course, layer uh, a stratum deep within the soils underlying the city. Previous research has shown that these soils exhibit significant reduction, no significant reduction in shear modulus even for shear strains as high as a tenth of a percent. As in, in addition, there's really been no significant increase, there shows no significant increase in damping ratio until shear strains on the order of 0.3% are reached. So as a result, the dynamic response of Mexico City clay deposits is nearly elastic, even for shear strains as high as as high as 0.3%. So, so this has led, of course, to the high potential for amplification of seismic waves. And during the 1985 Michigan earthquake, as, as was discussed, um, the peak ground accelerations on the soft soils were significantly ampli amplified by some studies on the order of five times larger than the PGAs on rock outcrop. While the corresponding spectral ordinance were on the order of 0.4 G to 1 G at approximately two seconds. So this led to the devastating consequences during that event of structures of that resonant period and above. In zone two soils, um, the soft clay deposits interbedded by a series of thin sand and silty layers. Um, these transitionary soils, um, have shallower soft clay deposits, uh, perhaps 20 meters or less. Nonetheless, they still have, of course, an underlying competent layer 
And in stark contrast, the hilly soils often, often are encompassed by volcanic rock and are stiff soils. <clears throat> As was discussed, the 1985 earthquake is an interesting, an important point of comparison. Um, these maps uh, show the seismological situation, remind us of the seismological situation during that event compared to the 2017 event. Although it had a large magnitude of 8.1, it occurred 15 kilometers deep near the coast of Michoacan, more than 350 kilometers from Mexico City. The earthquake occurred in the convergent limit between the plates of Cocos and the North American plate. The current event, of course, with a magnitude of 7.1, was deeper at 51 kilometers, however, occurred at the border between Morales and Puebla uh, and 100, uh, closer, 120 kilometers, Mexico City. And as was noted, it's being inside of the Cocos Plate, an intraslab event. Um, it, um, uh, its ramification of very different consequential ground shaking to the city itself. So the fact that Mexico City has suffered from so many past earthquakes, including the 1985 event, uh, give us quite a point of comparison. This map, is, uh, again, a repeat of the previous speaker, but it uh, shows us uh, not only that data from 1985 and the current event, but also overlays the current geoseismic zonation. Um, so one of the very interesting effects of this earthquake was the enormous difference in shaking intensity and associated building damage in these different parts of the city. Major structural damage from this event was concentrated in the central and northwest part of the city in the lake zone of the zone three soil, zone two and zone three soils. In the southwest part of the city, ground motions were moderately intense, let's say, and building damage was much less minor. For contrast, this map shows that the majority of the structural damage from this 2017 event is concentrated in the western and southwestern part of the city. Numerous researchers have investigated the pattern of building damage from the 1985 event. Uh, for example, Seed and others noted that the ground motions recorded on rock and hard soil had peak ground accelerations on the order of 0.04 g and peak spectral accelerations on the order of 0.1 g at predominant periods of two seconds. However, the ground motions recorded in the soft clay at PGAs of 0.17 seconds um, and peak spectral accelerations on the order of 1G out at two seconds. So sites that might be considered very similar from an engineering point of view, that slightly different soil conditions, um, for example, different depth and stiffness of the underlying soils exhibit, exhibited significant differences in the observed spectral response of the ground surface motions. So we know, of course, from that historical context in the present event, as well as others, that the site response in areas of Mexico City underlain by this less Katrine clay is extremely sensitive to small changes in the clay shear wave velocity, clay thickness, and overall soil layering. So at the time of the UNAM gear team's reconnaissance, 25 um, a number of stations were available to the team. Um, approximately 25 ground record, motion records from uh, IINGN, um, 49 of the Cyrus records, and 49 of the Cyrus records were made available to the team. Within the greater region of Mexico City, seven of these stations are shown here, overlaying with the geo zonation that we just looked at. Let's look perhaps at a couple of these recordings. The recording on the left, TACY, is taken in a hilly zone, whereas the recording on the right is taken within the lake zone, PCJR, and only encompasses the 2017 event. The spectra on the left shows both the 2017 and the 1985 event. The same map we looked at just a moment ago is shown in the upper left. If we can look at, by comparing the spectra, the peak spectral response from the 2017 event in terms of its horizontal components ranges 
between about 0.23 and 0.27 Gs at a predominant period of about 0 0.2, 0 0.22, 0 0.24 seconds. However, there's a substantial amount of energy concentrated within period ranges of 0.6 to 1.1 seconds. So clearly that led to ground motion amplification in the affected transition in lake zone areas. In contrast, as noted, the substantive long period spectral content during the 1985 event was within period ranges of two seconds or greater. So hence, again, the amplification of motions within the deeper central lake deposits were more significant and, and sensitive to the lake deposit characteristics and layering characteristics. So consequently, this continues to support the previous overlay of damage distribution and the fact that the 1985 event led to, to a concentration within the deeper deposits in contrast with the current event. To tease out and verify the side effects issue versus other geotechnical features is an ongoing effort of the UNAM gear team. A question comes to mind whether or not the basin characteristic may play a role in the ground shaking and its associated distribution and consequently its damage. And I don't think we can answer that at this point, but the team did endeavor to collect and enrich the database of understanding site periods to allow us to support this research problem in the future. So this map in the upper right uh, shows the distribution of H over V and, and, and other test information collected by the team. And in comparison to a map on the left generated by Arroya and others, which accounts for the changes in predominant periods due to regional subsidence effects. Um, the map on the left, on, on the leftmost map, indicates that within the transitionary zone two and the lake zones three A and B, the one where, where the concentration of damage during the present event was most predominant, predominant periods ranges from range from about 0.8 to 1.5 seconds. The periods reported in regions surveyed by the GEAR team in the present, in the present activity, uh, such as La Condesa, Roma Sur, and elsewhere in the wider CDMX area, were verified uh, to be consistent with these numbers. You can see the numbers in the upper right-hand map. Importantly, um, transitioning from the hilly region to the transition soils and then into the lake bed, one sees an elongation of that period on the order of 0.7 to 0.9 to 1 and then finally to about 1.2 and even in the southernmost regions in the Del Mar and Tahuaca area uh, 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 reaching quite large numbers on the order of two seconds. For contrast, sites surveyed by the team and by many members of, of the community such as Yehutla in the state of Morales and Puebla City in the state of Puebla um, we did conduct as well seismic testing in these regions. Yehudla reported site periods in the downtown on the year 0.27 seconds, which would help explain why many of why so many uh, uh, short, low rise, uh, stiff structures were damaged within the city and its outskirts. Uh, and similar discussion or similar outcome could be. Um, acknowledged by recognizing that Pueblo City site periods were on the order of 0.8 to 0.9 seconds. And in fact, in Pueblo City, though we won't talk about it here, future gear reports will document a number of mid-rise buildings, uh, mid and high-rise buildings that were damaged within the state of Puebla, which would be supported by the fact that the sites were of a longer period as well in the city and its outskirts. Shake maps produced by UNAM continue to support the distribution of high intensity in both CDM, CDMX and the southernmost states of Puebla and Morales. And I won't spend a lot of time on that since it was just discussed. But um, uh, it's some important outcomes um, from, hopeful outcomes from the GEAR UNAM effort um, include the mapping of the current damage data by geozonation as discussed. And if you take a look at the current data that uh, Luciano and colleagues have, one notes that almost uh, more than 85% of the moderate to significantly damaged buildings collected by the CICM brigades um, are within zones two and three A and B. All again, um, substantiating the site, uh, site effects 
as a predominant and important um, geotechnical impact from, from this event. Uh, so uh, we'll just briefly touch on this since Maggie was able to give us about 15 minutes each, I believe, and I'm already over my time, but a key aspect of GEAR's ongoing effort is to link, uh, is to offer a link between ground failure and structural damage as an indicator of performance for each is essential. So for this reconnaissance, we draw from the work of Bray and Stewart, who advanced the concept of ground failure and structural damage indices and utilized it following the 1995 uh, Adabazari and Kosial earthquakes. Lo local ground damage severity in this case is assigned a grade from minor to major gradation with qualitative interpretation associated with the severity of settlement and tilt. Structural damage features can be similarly assigned a damage severity in the work of Bray and in the work of Bray and Stewart, a discretization spanning five grades was used and was similarly adopted here, ranging from D0 to D5. D5, of course, would be complete collapse. D4 would be a, a collapse of a portion of the building in plan view, for example. So here, uh, here is where we can benefit from the utility of remote sensing. This video fly through shows a comparison of UAV imagery remapped onto a 3D model, which is navigatable by the user. So it's GPS reference and therefore can easily be interrogated by a user to find damage features captured at that time. This was captured on a composite set of UAV data collected both by, um, uh, by several researchers within the, within the team. Well, there are many interesting regions affected by this event that you know, the availability of that type of data allows us to continue to tease out the implications of side effects. So here we show one on the western region of CDMX and through the use of this type of map, uh, uh, which, whose coverage is shown in the blue here, the availability of the seismic testing, which is shown by the blue and yellow dots, the knowledge of the severe and moderately and collapsed damage buildings during this event and the previous event in blue, as well as of course, um, ground surface shaking measurements um, one can generate and help uh, tease out the implications or the effects, the relationship between foundation damage and structural damage. So we're using this type of information to map regions of both CDMX as well as the states of Puebla and Morales. This is just a sample of one of these where approximately 100 buildings were surveyed in the La Condesa region. Uh, we, uh, you know, one initially uh, moves towards this re region as significantly collapsed buildings were interspersed between uh, a, a relatively undamaged or completely undamaged buildings. Uh, one notes that about 80% of the buildings within the survey region had heights of less than three stories. Those with heights of six to 10 stories or so at least in this region, suffered the most significant damage. And so that consequently, consequently leads us to um, the correlation with MASW and HOV site response uh, uh, site periods that can, were calculated by the team. Um, other regions, um, we won't have time to go through them, but uh, this is a, a region in the su south, su southernmost portion of the city. Um, this video is interesting because it shows us um, not only the orthorectified image, but as well we turn in a moment, we can see the existing features as they were exasperated on the road. All of these uh, surficial um, ground pattern features, which unfortunately had to cross a number of, of residential dwellings and commercial buildings through the region of Del Mar. Um, uh, many of them existed in existing correct matter patterns that were generated through subsidence um, and understanding the understanding the link between the before situation and the after situation is something that remains to be uh, remains to be teased out from this event. Uh, this is just one sample of data that was collected within the states of Puebla. Um, here again we're mapping that 3D model. This is a region near downtown Puebla City. It offers insight into the implication of the earthquake shaking on older constructed buildings. Um, if one looks closely, they lean towards the street. Uh, street face at the front of each of these long buildings can be, can be readily observed and the availability of 3D models such as this allows us to go in and immediately um, extract 
the amplitude of that lean and its relative correlation to surficial features or neighboring buildings. So just a few concluding remarks. Um, we don't have a lot of time in these presentations to share with the community all of the findings, so I chose to uh, offer some insight into the current thinking on the implication of site response on damage patterns within the broader CDMX area. There, there certainly is a link between foundation performance and um, as well as the implication of existing subs subsidence in the regions of southern CDMX, Del Mar, and uh, Cochimilco and two, are two prominent areas. Um, important geotechnical features that were not present in this event warrant a point of recognition, uh, namely liquefaction and surface rupture. Um, finally, I think that uh, there are several unique contributions that the UNAM gear team effort can bring to light. Um, I hope, hope we've been able to share with you that there's now a, a, a richer a set of data that will become available through this effort uh, bounded, bound, founded on, on, seismic, on seismic testing co conducted immediately after this event, um, as well as uh, both on ground and aerial uh, remote, remotely sensed and collected information regarding damage, uh, damage to particular facilities and buildings. Um, the goal, I think, in this exercise is to generate a number of these damage maps through uh, which correlate both geotechnical features, foundation, and structural damage. Um, answer some of these questions, such as uh, what was the prominence of site effects, and was there a prominence of basin effects, uh, offer an expanse of the detailed case histories at the site, and ultimately um, we're hoping to distribute the 3D models that were collected through this effort through the NERI Design Safe interface. Um, that's some ongoing work that we're working with, with them on. Um, and my last bullet here is just to offer a plug. Um, this is a very short presentation, which I'm already over time. Surprise, Maggie hasn't kicked me off. But um, we are um, organizing a more focused UNAM gear webinar for tentatively, tentatively set for December 4th. So with that, I would conclude and uh, ask the moderator, I think, to um, switch. Just over. Uh, thank you, Tara, for the for the presentation. And so we'll move on right to the next one uh, on the Earth Earthquake Early Warning System by Richard Allen from UC Berkeley. Great, thank you. Um, so I'm here representing the uh, the team that was sent to uh, to look at the uh, effects and uses of the Earthquake Early Warning System um, in Mexico. Um, this this event um, and the fact um, that they have an earthquake early warning system in Mexico and have had since um, 1991 provided a, a real opportunity for us to learn about how earthquake early warning systems, which were a relatively new technology, Mexico City was actually the first, um, and there's only two, one other large scale public system in the world right now, Japan, but we're working pretty rapidly at this point towards an earthquake early warning system here in the US and at various other places around the world, similar efforts are underway. So this provided this event um, and the fact that Mexico City and Mexico as a whole has a warning system provided a real opportunity to learn um, about their system and learn about how people are using it. And so I kind of want to both acknowledge and thank um, ERI's learning from earthquake teams for recognizing this opportunity and, and making this happen, facilitating it. So you can see the team, um, four of the five team members um, are pictured here, myself, Richard Allen from UC Berkeley, Elizabeth Cochran from the USGS. Those are, we are the two seismologists that were on the team and we were paired up with uh, three social scientists, Thomas Huggins, Scott Miles and Diego Ortegi. Um, and we didn't know one another prior to this, uh, Elizabeth and I did, but the rest of the team didn't. Um, and so this was really a great opportunity to bring together a group of people with very different perspectives and to try and learn as much about this as quickly as possible. And I'm emphasizing that because what's important is that everything I'm going to show you is a consensus conclusion from, from the entire team, the five of us. Um, so we spent a week in Mexico City at the beginning of October. Um, I was uh, watching Tara's presentation. They had hard hats, hard shoes. 
mud and all kinds of things. We were more of a shirt sleeves, office meetings and coffee shops type of uh, um, reconnaissance team. Um, but we went and we met with um, various groups involved in actually providing the warning and issuing the warning. So that's Cirrus is the group, is an, an NGO that generates the alerts. C5, um, which you can see pictured here, that's the sort of security, um, high-tech security agency for the city that pushes the alerts out. Of course, we spent time with our colleagues at UNAM who were fabulous, as everybody else has mentioned, at helping us understand um, how the system set up and, and organizing for us to meet with various people. Um, so that's one group. Um, but then the other group is business owners, um, private warning companies, members of the public. We spent more than 50% of our time just trying to get a sense of how people used the earthquake early warning system. And, and that's where the key uh, uh, information, the key learnings come from. Um, just to give you a sense of, of the early warning system, I want to play this video. I think Este edificio se movió horrible, horrible, tronó horrible. Que se salgan, la pared, la pared se rompió. Que se salgan. Que se salgan, te va a caer ese edificio, te va a caer. Dios mío, Dios mío, Dios mío, Dios mío. Dios mío, Dios mío, Dios mío, Dios mío. La gente, la gente. Dios mío. No, Dios mío, Dios mío. Ay, Dios mío. Ari. Dios mío. ¿Estás bien, Fer? Well, what's important about this video, obviously, is that you can hear the siren sounding in the background, um, and then obviously the building collapses. Um, and so this illustrates that the warning system did go off, um, uh, first of all. I'll talk about that in more detail. Um, and there's, but there's also time between when the warning system goes off and when these buildings collapse, when damage occurred. And so clearly this illustrates the potential um, value or one potential value of using an early warning system. Okay, that's, um, the, the, as I mentioned at the beginning, the system was set up um, following the 1985 earthquake. They started running the system um, focused entirely on delivering, delivering early warnings in Mexico City um, initially in 1991. Um, it then became fully public in 1993. And since then, they've expanded the system. You can see this is a map of the stations that have been deployed, the, the solid circles of the stations deployed um, to provide early warning. They were originally focused on earthquakes, big earthquakes like the 1985 earthquake in the subduction zone. And so that's why there's the line of stations um, along the coast, but then recognized, of course, the hazard posed by earthquakes closer to Mexico City, and for that matter, earthquakes throughout um, the country as a whole. And so they deployed additional stations um, away from the coastline. Of course, this earthquake, the main damaging earthquake, the magnitude seven earthquake for Mexico City, um, was much closer than the coastline. Um, so they built the system for one type of earthquakes. Um, the system is now trying to handle more complex earthquakes. Um, and so let's um, talk about how, how it performed. Uh, before that, how do they push the warnings out? Um, it's quite remarkable. In Mexico City, the warnings are pushed out through 12,000 sirens. You can see a picture here of the sirens. These are sort of pole mounted sirens, essentially at uh, lamppost level. Um, these poles are operated by that C5 organization I mentioned. Um, they have security cameras and they have panic buttons. Um, and so they then have speakers at the top. And this allows the city to monitor what's going on um, uh, and to talk to people through these loudspeakers. And then the speakers are also used to issue warning across Mexico City. So that's probably the most important way the warnings get out in Mexico City. Um, but that is only Mexico City. The other ways that you can get the warnings are through dedicated radio receivers and sirens, um, of which modified NOAA weather radio, of which there's a few tens of thousands. And we weren't really able to evaluate these radio-based systems. We were mainly focused on the warning as it was received in Mexico City, which was primarily through people actually hearing the sirens. Okay, so in terms of earthquake early warnings, September was a pretty busy month. There were actually five times that those sirens um, went off in Mexico City. The first was on September the 6th. We actually couldn't figure out at exactly what time. Um, and that was a, a false alert that was uh, triggered by a technician 
um, who accidentally sounded the alarm on all of those sirens um, across the city. One day later was the magnitude 8.1 earthquake, very large magnitude earthquake, but of course quite away away from Mexico City. So that was widely felt across the city, but did little damage. In that case, the sirens went off, um, and there was about two minutes um, of warning from the system. Um, then on September 19th, um, the day of the magnitude 7 earthquake was, of course, also the anniversary of the 1985 earthquake. And so that's when they have an annual earthquake drill at 11 a.m. And so the siren sounded for a third time for that annual drill. And then a couple of hours later was the magnitude 7.1 earthquake, which did most of the damage. And again, the siren sounded. However, the siren sounded a few seconds after people started to feel the shaking. Um, just to show you um, some uh, data, a screenshot of a screenshot, um, what you can see, the red circle there is actually the seismogram in Mexico City. The red line, the vertical red line, is the time that they issued the warning, and you can see that that's a few two, three seconds after um, the shaking started. So that was the P wave, and the P wave was pretty strong, um, and so people clearly felt the P wave. So the point is that people actually started to feel the shaking a few seconds before the sirens went off for this magnitude 7 earthquake. Um, and then the final time that the sirens went off in September um, was on the 23rd. That was a magnitude 6.4 aftershock of the magnitude 8.1, so again 700 kilometers away. Sirens went off two minutes before the shaking arrived, um, but very few people felt shaking. We found only one person who actually felt the shaking for that earthquake. So in summary, um, the performance over the month for the, the early warning system wasn't great. Um, in the case of the main event, it did most damage. The alert was a few seconds after the shaking was felt. There were then two alerts that either had little damage or very little shaking. And then, of course, there was one false alert, the technician, and then one drill. Um, so those were the five alerts. So given that, what did people think of the early warning system? Well, we were really quite surprised, to be honest. People were actually very positive, or overall were very positive about the system. The system is valuable, is a comment that we heard commonly talking to people. Of course, people had gripes um, about uh, the system. People commented that they had to go outside in the rain when the alert sounds, and they didn't like that. They had to evacuate in the night, but didn't feel the shaking. The alert sounded after they started to feel the shaking. That's for the magnitude seven. But then they go on to say the system is valuable, the system is necessary, even and stupendous, one person uh, told us, after she just explained how all of the students at her school um, had to evacuate for one of those events that did not do much damage. And in fact, they were all standing in, in water because it was a big rainstorm and the playground where they had to evacuate to um, was flooded. So we were quite surprised that still people thought that um, the system was very valuable. And, and this just illustrates that people actually, they recognize the technical limitations of the warning system and, and they accept them. Again, a surprisingly um, positive response. Next question we addressed is, what do people consider to be false alerts? This is something that we are currently debating. What is a false alert for an early warning system here in the US? And the public definition was actually very clear. A, a false alert is, is an alert when there's no earthquake. So individuals don't have to feel the event. Individuals don't have to see damage around them. Um, they just need to know that there was an earthquake and then they don't consider an alert to be a false um, alert. They then go on to comment that even false alerts, like the technician, for example, um, uh, sounding the sirens by accident, were drills. And so they saw real value in having these um, sirens go off periodically and people going through the process of what they do, the reactions in an earthquake, um, are seeing that as a, as a drill. Um, one CFO of a, a company, uh, he described BBB, it's a supermarket chain similar to Trader Joe's, commented that they could have a drill or an alert every couple of months, and that would be just fine. And um, they would lose about 30 minutes worth of work time, but it would improve the awareness and response um, that people had in these earthquakes. So, so the conclusion here is that there's a, a greater tolerance for false events than there is missed events. Um, people don't mind a few false events, but they really do want an alert when there actually is an earthquake. Next piece was, what's the right message? And it's pretty simple. In fact, that's the point. It has to be simple. The right message for an earthquake should simply be earthquake. Um, so no detailed information. We've been thinking about providing more complex messages here in the US. 
um, things providing information about the intensity or the magnitude of the um, event, the intensity that people should expect, the time till they should expect the shaking. But what was very clear is people don't understand this, and it just causes confusion, it causes hesitation, and instead the information should be very simple, earthquakes, so people immediately take their protective um, actions. But then that needs to immediately be followed by additional information. As soon as people had taken cover under a desk or in some cases evacuated outside of buildings, the first thing they wanted to do, was on their, they were on their phones trying to understand what had just happened. And so pushing out information in the seconds and minutes after that first alert is critical. And of course, social media is, is, is what matters here. People don't go to the USGS website, the equivalent of the USGS website, and people are looking on social media for this information. So we have to broaden the way that we push out this information um, as, as we move forward. Um, and then the fact that they then can validate that there was an earthquake, even if they didn't feel it, it again mitigates the potential frustration that people have about false alerts. And so this leads to the broader um, uh, thing that we realized is this concept of seismic culture and building seismic culture, seismic culture being awareness about earthquakes, valuing taking protective measures ahead of time. Um, and earthquake early warning really helps feed the seismic culture in a positive way. It really increases earthquake awareness. Um, it's another mechanism to, for people to think about earthquakes, to think about their impacts, to think about response, and to think about preparedness. So that's a sort of, if you like, a broader impact of earthquake early warning systems. And then finally, one comment that we thought was important that we brought back with us as we set up the system here is that design matters. Um, people are much more interested in getting the alerts in ways that they find interesting, they find technologically advanced, they find them to be cool devices. Um, and they want to see people who are delivering warnings, innovating um, and providing the alerts in the ways that they want. And that's something that was very apparent um, in Mexico and is something that I think we need to learn um, here in the US as well. So I'm going to try and sum up. We have we kind of came to five um, sort of key um, recommendations. Um, the first is that earthquake early warning is seen as being valuable and that's despite these technical limitations, non-perfect performance and mixed messages about the protective actions. I didn't really talk about that. Still people see it as being valued and this really should give us confidence about accelerating um, the deployment of earthquake early warning systems elsewhere. Secondly, initial, the initial alert should be as simple as possible, just earthquake. And so that just prompts immediate protective actions on the part of the recipients. Um, number three, follow-up information is critical in the seconds, minutes after the alert. And social media is really a key channel for communicating this information. That is how most people get this information. Uh, number four, um, warning information from all sources should be consistent. Um, and obviously that's to prevent confusion. There, there is a sort of primary public system, this NGO system, and then there are also some private systems um, uh, in, in Mexico. And this causes confusion or caused confusion um, about the information. And so having a simple, consistent message is, is key. And then finally, um, earthquake early warning is only as good as the likelihood that effective action is taken, obviously. And so early warning development must be paired with disaster preparedness, research, education, planning, and policy. And, and this is something that we've, I think we've all known all along, um, but it's something that, uh, that was really very apparent to us as a team in Mexico. And so obviously it's something for us to be working towards as we develop these early warning systems elsewhere. Okay, and with that, I'll stop and pass it back over. Thank you, Richard, for your uh, presentation. Uh, next, we have uh, Luciano Fernandez again from uh, WAM speaking on the structural impacts. Thank you, Gilberto. So now I'm going to talk about the, the structural impact of the earthquake. So as a little overview, I'm going to talk a little bit about ground motion, um, about some of the collapse structures and some statistics about the damage structures and the type of damage. So uh, from the ground motion, and I'm going to take advantage that advantage that Tara explained very well how our city is um, divided. So this slide shows the 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 stations that CITES has uh, around the city, and with the red dots, 
um, there are pointed out the stations that record more than 200 gals. With blue dots are the stations with more than 150 gals, and with purple dots are the stations with more than 100 gals. So, as Tara said, you can see that the greater ground motion was concentrated on this 3A zone, the, the orange zone, and especially on the south part of the city. So, in terms of the structural response, um, I want to show you some spectral res uh, response spectrum. So, for example, for the three stations that record the largest PGA uh, values uh, are all in Tlalpan, uh, in Delegación Tlalpan. And in these, um, in these figures, you can see the elastic response spectrum in both directions, north, south, and east, west. And then on a gray line, you can see the design spectrum from the building code. And in yellow line, you can see the design spectrum, but multiplied by um, the um, overstrength factor. So the elastic response spectrum from design is a yellow one. So you can see that in these three, three stations, uh, all the ground motions, the, the elastic response spectrum are larger than the design one. So we had a very, very large uh, motion. Uh, when we all go up, for example, to Colonia del Valle that had a lot of damage, you can see that there was a lot of, of, of a spectral response of some structures uh, around 0.5 seconds and 0.6 seconds, but are all covered by the by the building code. Mm, same happened in Roma Condesa with softer soil, so we have a larger uh, spectral, uh, larger periods on the spectral accelerations. And if we go go to the south of the city, you can see, for example, in Xochimilco, there are especially for the for smaller structural periods for high frequencies, we had a lot of, of response of, of spectral response. And Tlahuac is a very special case because in Tlahuac, even the building code said that we need more, more research about the soils on Tlahuac because it has a very, very different uh, properties as Tara said before. So with this in mind, um, I want to talk about the, the collapsed buildings. So as it has been already said, the almost, all, almost all the collapsed buildings were near the transition zone, but especially on the, in the lake bed zone with the um, narrower uh, soil deposits. So here I'm doing just an analysis of 32 buildings. This 32 collapsed buildings um, were concentrated, especially from four to seven story. You can see that from the collapsed buildings, 10 buildings were with five stories height. And from four to seven stories, we had 21 cases from 32 cases. So the largest damage was concentrated in those, in those buildings. Um, here I'm showing you the analysis of the structural configuration of the 32 collapsed buildings that, that we analyzed. From the 32 buildings, uh, six, 16 buildings has soft stories, six buildings has some irregularity in play or, or in elevation, 12 buildings were corner, corner buildings. In 85 we had a lot of problems with, with corner buildings because of torsion. Uh, seven buildings had flat slabs, one building had clearly pounding, and 10 buildings were very old buildings with very with a lot of 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 uh, bad maintenance and lack of lateral resistance. So from these 32 buildings, it, it's important to point out that that only one was designed and built after 85. So I would like to show you some photographs of the collapsed buildings. For example, this building is in Paseo de las Galias in Iztapalapa. It has a soft story failure. It's very clear here that the, the soft story was developed at the ground uh, floor. We had some problems with the corner buildings due to torsion. This building in, in, in Colonia del Valle has a lot of torsion due to the, the walls 
on the neighbor buildings and the a lot of glass and a lot of, of uh, very light facades on the parts of, of to the street so it has a lot of torsion uh, we had some combinations for example this building was a combination with the flat slab and a corner building so it has a partial collapse and some irregularity in height for example this building in bolivar this is the the building that 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 i was talking about in the other presentation the building where a lot of people died and you can see on the right part on the upper part that there's a transfer slab between the upper structural system and the column doesn't continue to the ground floor so maybe that was the issue where, why the the building collapsed some maybe pounding effects for example this building may may have be stroke by the the white building on the on the right and then that's why the damage was concentrated on the second floor and for example very old buildings with no maintenance and very bad um, resistance this is the building that we were seeing the video in the last presentation so this is just a photograph of that building so again uh, here is the, the the distribution of damaged structures uh, along the city. You can see that most of the damage was concentrated of the on 3A zone with uh, clay deposits around 20 to 30 meters. And from the 100% of damaged structures, 44% were from one to three stories, 44% were from four four to eight stories. And just 10% were from nine to 15 stories and very few buildings with more than 15 stories. So it was clearly a short period uh, earthquake and with short period uh, structures damage. Um, then when we made the, the ratio between the non-structural damage structures and the structures with the structural damage, the chart on the, on the left, uh, shows the how is the distribution so buildings between one to three stories has 26 percent of those buildings have some structural damage and 74 percent of those buildings have non-structural damage something uh, similar happened to the buildings from four to eight story and it's interesting that the buildings from nine to fifteen stories uh, that were damage in some manner there 35 percent of buildings have some structural damage and 65 percent of buildings have almost uh, only non-structural damage and then for the taller buildings the ratio was very similar to the to the small ones then on the chart on the on the left on the right side of the of the slide we are showing the type of damage and how many buildings have that different type of damage. So we have uh, 13 total collapse buildings that of the buildings that we review, uh, 141 partial with partial collapse, and uh, the most uh, present type of damage was damage in some structural element. But it is interesting to see that there was a lot of damage uh, um, that has something to do with the soil or, or foundation. We have of the old reviewed buildings, 51% of the buildings have some problem associated with the soil. So it, we have a lot of problems with the foundation and soil on this on this earthquake. And that's due to the very difficult soil conditions on, on Mexico City. So I'm now I'm I would like to show you some of some pictures of the most uh, common damage that we found. So we had a lot of damage on, on infill or facade walls, uh, in a lot of cases with unconfined masonry walls. So this 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 is a non-structural damage, but it was it has been very um, with a, we have had a lot of troubles with this damage because people cannot be in their houses. So you can see in these three photographs that the main concrete structure has almost no damage. But we have very, very large non-structural damage that takes the building off the use. Uh, we have some damage, not very spread, but some damage in some confined masonry. That was one case where the 
confined elements are very damaged due to shear. But the most um, spread damage that we found was on columns. Columns had a lot of trouble, a lot of damage. Uh, one type of damage that we found on columns was uh, shear cracks. We have from very small shear cracks to complete failure on shear, like the column on the top left uh, photograph. So we had a lot of problem with, with shear on, on columns, especially on ground floor co columns. But not only shear cracks, we have problems again on, sh on short column effect. You can see there are three examples of short columns effects in different, in different buildings. We have problems in the in lack of adherence and, and very and lack of, of cover on the on the concrete columns, uh, especially due to the use of very large rebars and packages of, of rebars that we already know that are that doesn't work well, but these buildings are, are prior 85, so they exhibit this this type of problems. And we had some failures on joints, on beam to column joints. So we had some joint cracking. Uh, you can see in these two pictures how the damage was concentrated on the joint of, of, the, of the beam and column. So um, I would like to show you this, this um, case that it's, I believe that it's very interesting because this is a case, we have a school down and then a church uh, next to the school and due to the collapse of the church you can see that the school was very damaged so even when the school had no damage by itself it was damaged because of the of falling parts of the church so we can we we need to have a lot of of information and a lot of um, take care about the neighbor buildings because these these things can happen and about the the failures on foundation or soil or and soil we found for example here in a group of buildings in cafetales in tlalpan we found that the from the eight buildings that are in the same part of the city all buildings had some soil failure and even in one building we found that foundation failure that you can see on the on the on the image on the left and on the right side of the of, on the right side of the slide that the beam, the foundation beam had already failed. So as concluding remarks, we found that we had a large values of PGAs and large values of spectral acceleration, especially from structures for, from 0.5 to 1.5 seconds. The collapse structures, all collapse structures has some deficiencies on configurations, on the structural configuration. But mostly collapse and damage structures were, are pre-85. So we can be confident about no, our designs nowadays. 90% um, of damage are, are structures from eight story or less. So uh, stiff structures. 51% of the structures have some soil foundation problem. And from the structural damage, we found damage on infill and facade walls on concrete columns and some confined masonry. In, we can say that in general, uh, buildings with modern design, designs performed reasonably well. Small structural damage on the school and hospitals, we didn't have a lot of, of damage on those two types of structures that are very important. And we have a lot of buildings that were designed and built prior to 85. So we need a retrofit program, not only for the damaged structures, but we have to take care of those structures that were not damaged in this build in, in this earthquake, but maybe damaged in a future earthquake that are uh, old buildings or are buildings that are this, that were designed with no modern techniques. And we found that some of the retrofitted buildings had moderate or some of the retrofitted field buildings have large damage. So we have to review that well in order to improve our, our retrofit um, techniques. So I would like to acknowledge again, all the information and photos has been taken from the Colegio SME and SME recognition teams. You can check those, that information on that webpage. The ground motions were given by CIRES. 
the collapse building analysis was performed by Professor Alcocer, and the computation of response spectrums was done by Ugon Juarez from Guam and Samuel Rosling from University of Oakland. And the photos from Cafetales buildings were given by Professor David Muria from UNAM. So thank you very much. And again, if you have some questions, that's my email and the web page. Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you, Luciano, for, for the for the insightful presentation. Uh, next, we have um, Erica Fisher from Oregon State University speaking on uh, lifeline impacts. Erica, you may be on mute. There we go. Thanks so much. Um, all right, so I am Erica Fisher. I'm an assistant professor of structural engineering at Oregon State University. And today I'm going to be presenting on behalf of um, a team that went down to look at lifeline impacts in this earthquake. Okay. Sorry, my screen has... Frozen. There we go. All right. So when we talk about lifelines, we can talk about a number of different systems, um, ranging from water and wastewater systems all through natural gas, highways, transportation. Um, but for the sake of brevity and um, and just for this presentation, I'm going to focus on these first three systems. So in order to talk about uh, water and wastewater systems and um, Thank you to Luciano and Tara for covering a lot of this, um, but we, we kind of need to understand what the history of Mexico City is. And so as uh, Luciano and, and Tara pointed out, this is, uh, Mexico City was founded on an old saline lake bed in a closed basin. So there's no natural drainage surrounded by volcanic mountains. There's um, seasonal intense rainfall patterns in Mexico City and the city is built on clay soil. So all of these factors combined really lead to a expensive and complicated infrastructure system without earthquakes. And so we add seismicity into it and um, the system becomes even more complicated and expensive. So if we um, just cover this, the history just a little bit more, um, in 1520 when the Spanish conquered the Aztecs, the water distribution system was consisted of um, aqueducts that carried spring water from the northern region of the basin to the southern region of the basin. In the 1700s, that basin was artificially open to accommodate for stormwater drainage. So as I mentioned before, the basin doesn't have any natural drainage for stormwater, um, and so this had to be um, artificially opened up. In the mid 1800s, the Spanish discovered groundwater and built a number of wells around the city for groundwater extraction. And this became the main source of potable water throughout the city. However, about 100 years later, after significant subsidence of the city, scientists concluded that all of this groundwater extraction was consolidating the clay that the city is built upon and linking it to subsidence of the city. And so many of these wells were closed up, but there's still groundwater extraction in that southern region of the city from a natural aquifer. So if we look at what the modern water system and water network is today uh, in Mexico City, Water, the main source of potable water is this Kutsamala Reservoir that's located out here, about 100 kilometers away from the city, and um, is, is pumped in through a number of, of pipes into the city. And um, so this becomes, you know, as I mentioned before, very complicated, very expensive, um, and um, all during non-earthquake times. So um, this groundwater extraction that has occurred for, for hundreds of years in Mexico City um, has led to constant and increasing subsidence of the city. And this has really put stress on the pipelines and the aqueduct systems. Um, and it's also caused difficulty in stormwater drainage. Originally in the beginning of the 20th century, the, the lakes that um, Mexico City was draining its stormwaters to um, had an elevation lower than the city. And so gravity could be used for stormwater drainage. However, today that's not true. The city is actually at a lower elevation than these lakes. And so this stormwater has to be pumped out of the city. 
And so we're, le we're, we're left with more flooding, um, decreased quality of potable water, and decreased continual access to potable water. And again, all during all without earthquakes. And so when we add earthquakes into, into the mix, we can see that um, this damage to the water infrastructure system was not unique to this particular earthquake. Mexico City has a long history of documented damage to aqueducts and um, buried pipes within Mexico City due to earthquakes. <clears throat> And if we look about where this occurred um, in this particular earthquake, this map that I'm showing here, the, the red dots were reported um, damaged buildings. The blue outline is the outline of the clay deposits of the lake. Um, and these stars are where we saw uh, pipeline damage to the water infrastructure system. And so um, Luciano and, and Tara pointed out that these two, two regions in particular had very high ground um, accelerations and then um, also have very soft soils. So if we just dive into one of these regions and look at um, what this actually looks like, we were able to take some drone footage of the area just to give ourselves some perspective. Um, this region does not have continual and regular access to potable water. There's um, significant subsidence in this region on just a regular basis. And you can see the population density that um, is in this region in particular. And so what we saw in this region was a lot of differential ground movement. And all what I'm showing here is, is due to the earthquake itself. We, were, we didn't see this type of behavior in other regions of the city. This is definitely unique to this particular region. And as, as Luciano pointed out, um, the soils in this region are, are very different than what's in the rest of the city. And so if we think about um, that this region has continual subsidence um, more than other regions of Mexico City. And then if we look at the amount of differential ground movement um, due to the earthquake itself, we can realize that there was definitely probably um, there's a lot of water infrastructure damage in this region. And so um, what we saw is um, down one particular street um, that they've kind of boxed in in red over on the left, um, we saw uh, people, you know, workers repairing the pipelines. And um, so we see in all of these pictures, we saw, we see two pipes. So we see a main transmission line, which is the responsibility of the city, and then we see a primary distribution line, which is the responsibility of the local jurisdiction. And um, however, it was it was nearly impossible to repair that main transmission line without repairing the primary distribution line. And, um, and so we saw just, we saw um, holes up and down the street and it seemed a little haphazard at first and so we were we were talking with the workers and they said you know it's really difficult to determine where the leaks occurred these pipes are so interconnected throughout the entire network that it's really difficult to to understand where the actual leak is in these pipes and um so they were you know repairing the primary distribution line along with the main transmission line um however they weren't you know their, their intention wasn't to repair that primary distribution line. And so the people in this region saw the repairs happening and thought, you know, they would get access to water very quickly. Um, however, that didn't happen um, because, you know, uh, the, the job of, of these workers was to um, repair the main transmission line. And so they weren't necessarily looking for leaks in that primary distribution line. So this just caused a lot of confusion between um, the local jurisdiction, uh, the government of Mexico City, and, and the public. And so in the meantime, um, what Mexico City did is they set up these uh, temporary tanks throughout these regions and had water trucks circulating nonstop in order to uh, provide water to this population. So when we move on to electrical power, uh, there was um, about 35% of the electrical power users were affected. However, the restoration occurred really, really quickly. And um, a lot of it was, res was fully restored. And um, so if we look at this plot that, um, that we, we took from the National Center for Energy Control, um, this is a plot of, of two weeks, of, of three consecutive Tuesdays um, of the, electrical demand in Mexico City. And so um, one week before the earthquake, two weeks before the earthquake, and the day of the earthquake. 
We can see there's about a 5,000 megawatt drop at the time of the earthquake, but the demand was quickly restored. Um, so it was just a couple of hours and by the end of um, business day, the electricity was, was back on in a lot of these regions. So um, moving on to telecommunications, um, what I'm showing here is a building in Quapa, and uh, this particular building was a central office building that served the neighborhood. The, the building is a pre-1985 building that had some irregularities. Uh, there was a lot of soil settlement in this region, and it damaged some of the water uh, pipes that fed into the HVAC system um, that cooled the server rooms, and especially the 911 server room. And so workers in this building were carrying up buckets of water in order to continue that HVAC system and, and cool the 911 server room so they could continue the 911 service uh, calls. So uh, we just thought it was an interesting story that how um, the telecommunications network was continued and, and how all these, you know, the water network, telecommunications, and the building performance are also interconnected. So this is a plot of the spectral acceleration in that specific region, and we can see there's a, quite a big spike at that one to two second period, and this is where the, the building would fall into. So it makes sense the building was damaged um, during the earthquake. Okay, so, so in, uh, in Huhutla, uh, many of us know this town was very heavily damaged uh, and they lost uh, their telecommunications and, and cell towers. Um, there was no cell service right after the earthquake, but uh, companies came in and set up these, uh, these telecommunications towers right after the earthquake, um, only a couple of days, they said three days after the earthquake so that people could have cell phone service. Okay, so um, I'm from the Pacific Northwest, I am at Oregon State and the rest of my team, um, a lot of them were from Seattle. And so we uh, were, were, we kept comparing this um, to a potential earthquake in the Pacific Northwest. And so um, as Luciano mentioned, this was a deep intraslab intra earthquake um, and it's, it was very similar to the Nisqually, the 2001 Nisqually earthquake, where it was a very deep earthquake the epicenter was away from the metropolitan region, but due to the soils and the basin, um, there was amplification of the ground movement within that metropolitan region and caused damage um, to many of the buildings and lifelines. So um, there's a lot to learn for the Pacific Northwest. We have these basins not only in Seattle, but in Portland, in the Columbia River area in Oregon, and the Willamette River area in Oregon. So I'm um, learning from how Mexico City recovered and um, how the buildings performed is very applicable to the Pacific Northwest. So as I mentioned, this was a, a larger effort of many um, individuals on our team. I'm um, from Oregon State University. Uh, this was a Reed Middleton led team with um, engineers from MRP Engineering and WRK Engineers. Um, we want to thank ERI for all of the coordination they did, which was incredible amongst all the teams. Um, we were in contact with a number of UNAM professors and uh, Luciano at, at SME who helped us out tremendously. And so um, if, you, if you guys have any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them um, through email. Thank you. Thank you, Erica. Um, I wanted to wrap up with a few um, afterthoughts and these are some slides uh, put together by uh, Lucy and, and um, myself on, uh, oh, let me go to the beginning, uh, on, uh, on potential of future studies, reconnaissance gaps, and next steps uh, we could take. Again, Lucy, Irene, and myself, and myself were uh, selected as a, as a reconnaissance co-leads uh, by ERI for this earthquake. And I'll um, say a couple of words. I'll try to keep it short to, to uh, keep some time for, uh, for questions. And so, especially, I think where, where a lot of um, um, my colleagues have discussed a certain topic, you know, they're more of the expert in that certain area, so I'll be particularly brief. Um, so we wanted to, based on, you know, our preliminary findings, identify research, research and learning opportunities, which I think there are many uh, 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 
to be studied here in, after this earthquake, and particularly those that could affect the built environment as, and the social sciences that could help us in improving the resilience of, of communities. Um, there are needs, and you know, there's already been a lot of efforts in this area in terms of data collection and, uh, and sharing of contacts. Uh, in particular, we wanted to, uh, to lessen the burden on, on, on colleagues in, in, in Mexico, for example, as you know, they had a lot of work to do, but at the same time, uh, a, lot, a lot of visitors that were in the area uh, uh, seeking their assistance in, in the reconnaissance efforts. Um, there's been a, a lot of collaboration, and we should continue uh, with uh, the U.S., uh, New Zealand, Chile, Ecuador, and other countries are just some of the ones that I ran across while I was there. Um, but there were many others, as other presenters have, have mentioned. And so, again, you know, uh, I think so through the efforts of, of VRI and organizing and connect, connecting a lot of these, uh, these researchers uh, has helped uh, tremendously in organizing and, and potentially minimize the burden on our, on our, on our colleagues there. Um, a lot of outlets for sharing the results, including uh, mainly through ERI, including uh, the, the, the Clearinghouse website, uh, potential for publications in Earth, Earthquake Spectra, the Pulse, and, and the many others. Uh, the, the Clearinghouse was mentioned earlier, and uh, there's already have been some articles published through uh, the polls. Um, we have, uh, um, in terms of, of structural, I think there's a lot more to be studied and learned. Uh, you know, a lot of the presenters mentioned on, on this on, on um, this aspect. Uh, there are, um, you know, some differences and similarities between urban and especially the more rural areas. When you compare, for example, uh, the, the city and Hohutla, um, comparison to pre and post 85 construction, there's very few cases of, of damage to uh, post uh, 85 construction. Um, but still something to be looked at in terms of um, in terms of what were the cause of the damage in, in those cases. Um, and you know I think what struck me and also a lot of the researchers that as I uh, that I talked to while we were there is kind of the, the perceived similarities in uh, construction and differences and the actual performance where you see you know a, a block a, a neighborhood with a block within a neighborhood and you have one one structure collapse where the rest, Seem to have be similar uh, construction and, and are there with some without no apparent uh, damage. So it's very interesting to see this, this kind of the, the comparison of you know or one building every, within a block and and the rest have have done well. Um, the performance of retrofits is certainly something uh, worth noting. I think you know Mexico is was, is in a unique situation having ex having uh, experienced an, an earthquake. Uh, in 85 and, and again um, in, in, in 2017 and to look at the, the performance of those buildings that were retrofitted. I mean, the earthquakes seem to have affected different regions of the city. Uh, nonetheless, I think there was strong, strong shaking uh, throughout the city in, 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 um, in both uh, cases. Right. And so looking at the location of buildings, the geotechnical effects, age of buildings would be important to, to further understand um, what are the, the largest vulnerabilities in this uh, earthquake. Um, Looking at code changes, uh, the, uh, Mexico is currently going, or the, the city at least is going through uh, through uh, 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 a, a code uh, revision process, and uh, how this earthquake could affect uh, or, or impact the the, the, the outcome of, of these uh, revisions. Um, it also would be important to look at the codes and how they're uh, and how they're applied by a region. For example, the city seems to have codes well enforced. Whereas other regions like Seho Hootla, for example, may, may not. Um, and also look at the performance of, of confined masonry as being one of the predominant forms of, of, uh, of construction. So there's uh, many research efforts. One in particular, you know, I think uh, mentioned by uh, Sergio Alcocer and, and also by Rodolfo Valles, an engineer in the city, on the emergency exits and how um, these should perhaps be treated in, in with a little bit more, uh, more, more uh, concern in, in their design. To allow for these uh, for evacuation routes following an, following an earthquake, um, well, there's also questions on how the buildings are designed uh, and how they're actually constructed and 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 uh, and the inspection process, and also uh, training of, of individuals in confined mainstream methods, especially in the more rural areas. And there's already quite a bit of programs in Mexico, so it'd be interesting it's interesting to see how uh, some of these buildings, uh, some of these uh, uh, more ho homes and dwellings that have been um, build following these uh, recommended techniques have, have performed in the earthquake. Um, on the geotechnical, 
geotechnical effects, again, we saw a lot of this already on the strong, is probably an understatement, but this, the correlation between the soil damage, and soil conditions and the structural damage and the ongoing changes in the soil and how, how that could affect the, uh, which is already being considered in, in, in the building codes and, and uh, of the design of, of structures there in the city. Um, and so there's many lessons that can be learned here and it'd be in particular important to see how these lessons apply to the city as well as other regions that we saw Erica, for example, mentioned the comparison to uh, the Pacific North Northwest. Um, also, uh, a lot more to be done in terms of uh, lifelines, um, including the effects of, 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 the, of, of the, the geotechnical effects on the damage to lifelines, uh, the links to social science, and uh, and, um, and 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 additional um, solutions going forward to provide more timely access to water and power. As Erica mentioned, I think power was recovered fairly quickly. Water was, I think for water, that was not the case in some areas. Um, and so it'd be important to compare how these systems perform. And, and Erica mentioned this as well, comparing the 85 and, and, and 2017 performance of, of these lifeline uh, systems. Um, the early uh, warning system, um, we there's also some work here to do in terms of, of as, uh, as uh, uh, Richard mentioned in terms of following up on what type of follow-up information uh, uh, should be provided, uh, what information should be provided through the warning, I guess it's as simple, keeping it as simple as possible there, and what additional information should follow up following the earthquake and how these early warning systems could be applied through the city and the world, especially as they're being considered here in the, U, in the U.S. Um, also, uh, we had, uh, Lucy and I had the unique opportunity to visit the uh, resilience office of 100 resilient office uh, cities uh, sponsored by the Rockefeller Foundation in uh, Mexico City. And so uh, this event will certainly, uh, could certainly uh, focus attention of, of the city on, on how to uh, improve its resiliency following an earthquake. And uh, we should seek to continue collaborating with, with, uh, with this uh, office. Um, the Hausner uh, fellows are planning to further study the resilience issue and we look forward to, to these uh, efforts, including uh, what's going on in the city versus other more, more rural uh, areas. Uh, there's you know, also, there's been some interest from, from uh, many folks I've talked to regarding schools and, and the research needs there, how the codes are, are building construction codes are applied to public versus private schools and so forth, and the, the existence of, of older schools as well. Um, they may not be uh, cold compliant, so there's uh, certainly more to look into uh, there. And from the social sciences aspect, especially the volunteer mobilization was very interesting for, for following this earthquake, how uh, volunteers essentially were essentially to mo mobilize before, uh, before uh, government efforts moved in and to help, uh, to help those in need, including, uh, the, including for, for assessment of structural buildings. I think there was a shortage of social, structural engineers in particular. A lot of people were waiting for a final assessment of their, of their building. Uh, but as Luciana mentioned, it would be good to have a lot of these teams uh, be paired up with uh, building officials that can have a final say on, on the outcome of building. If, if, if people should be allowed to move back in or if, uh, uh, if the building should be demolished to give a final outcome to, um, to a lot of the people that were waiting for, for the outcome on, of their uh, building. And as Luciana also, also mentioned, um, you know, how could the use of social media, uh, for WhatsApp, for example, uh, be better used? Uh, it was a very helpful tool uh, for, for people um, to communicate, uh, especially a lot of the reconnaissance teams that, that went down there. Um, there are currently teams in, in, uh, in uh, Mexico right now. ASC, for example, has a team down there now, and there's been discussions of future studies uh, Future teams to follow up with uh, with the recovery efforts, especially to collect data on on resilience, um, uh, and these future studies could follow up on, on you know more detailed studies of buildings, for example, and, and other infrastructure and data mining of the various repositories, such as uh, the data collected by the Colegio de, de Ingenieros. A lot of data there to be looked at and to better understand uh, the effects of this earthquake. Again, this is you know two months following the event, so these are uh, preliminary findings and. Uh, and we look forward to uh, the continued uh, investigations uh, by the various uh, researchers. I'd like to close by acknowledging, first of all, the presenters today. Um, so th thank you all for taking the time to uh, present. Uh, the colleagues in Mexico, especially, you know, Luciano was one of the ones that helped a lot of teams down there and also was able to uh, lend himself uh, 
uh, some time to present um, in, in the today. Um, there's a lot of individuals and there's too many to be listed at the risk of forgetting some of tend to be general, but a lot of individuals and organizations in Mexico that supported uh, the international reconnaissance efforts, a lot of them have already been mentioned by the various uh, presenters. And also all the researchers that, that went down there that, you know, a lot of us mentioned the teams that we were part of uh, during during our field reconnaissance investigations, but thank you to all those who, who participated in these uh, efforts. And lastly, I'd like to thank the ERI headquarters, particularly the Learning from Earth Day programs, uh, Maggie in, in particular for all her work in, in coordinating all the teams and uh, and uh, for preparing this, uh, this uh, webinar. So thank you to all for uh, participating. Uh, I think we could uh, uh, build, open it up for uh, questions if there's some uh, time. And uh, with this, perhaps I'll turn, turn it over to uh, Maggie uh, so we could coordinate the question and answer in the, in the few minutes we have uh, left. Thanks, Gilberto. So we do have a few questions that have come in, um, and I don't think that we're going to have time to answer all of them. So I'm just going to uh, pick a few from the list. Um, so one of the questions, and, and this is probably directed towards Richard about Earth, the earthquake early warning system um, from Bill Holmes, is asking about appropriate protective action. So what people should do um, what, once they hear um, an alert from the warning system. So Richard, maybe do you want to describe a little bit of, of what you learned there and, and what's recommended and what se people seem to do? So actually that's a really interesting question because one of the things that we learned when it comes to protective actions is that there's a lot of confusion about what you should do. So the official advice on what you should do to protect yourself in an earthquake, irrespective of whether there's an early warning or not, is very similar to the US. You should um, take cover um, under a sturdy table, basically move to a safe place right where you are. However, this contrasts with what they encourage everybody to do for the annual earthquake drill when they sound the sirens at 11 o'clock um, every year, um, which is that they want everybody to evacuate the buildings. So there's actually a complete mismatch between what they tell people they should do in an earthquake and what they ask people to do in, in one of the drills. So that's a serious issue that was quite sort of um, shocking to, to find. Um, in terms of, so what the official advice for what people should do is, is that they should take cover in, in, uh, in, their, current, in their current room rather than evacuate a building. When we actually talk to people about what they did, um, people in the taller buildings, uh, they all thought through this process and we, they had made decisions ahead of time um, as to whether they were going to try and get out of a building or not, depending on what floor they worked or lived on. And we found that typically that if you were on the first two or three floors, people would try and get out of the building. Um, whereas if you were on a higher floor, people recognized that they were in more danger trying to get out of the building along with however many other people are trying to get out. And so they would just shelter in place. Um, and so, so that's the, so it, I, I forget exactly, sorry, the specifics of the question, whether there was one piece of guidance, the guidance is always to shelter in place, but people who think that they can get out of a building, obviously we're ignoring that. Thanks, Richard. Um, so in the interest of time, we'll move on to the, one of the next questions, which is from Josh Gabelin, and this is for Erica. If you, Erica, if you could comment on the performance of subways and bridges if that's something you looked at. Sure. Um, yeah, so we we didn't see a lot of damage to bridges. Um, we didn't do an in-depth study of, of bridges, though. And um, what we found for the metro was that the metro was shut down um, until about 5.30 p.m., and but that was due to electrical, um, the electrical outage. Thanks, Erica. Uh, so another question we have here, this is for Luciano, um, or and maybe Gilberto from Laura Whitehurst. Was there any damage seen in steel structures? Uh, in general, we haven't seen damage in steel structures. We had one collapse that it was a um, 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 supermarket uh, that was a steel structure, but it, it it was no very large damage on the steel structures, very, very little damage. I don't know if that was because of the 
of the gold construction of the steel structures or maybe because steel structures are has a little longer uh, predominant period so here in mexico we use the steel mainly for tall structures so maybe that's why we didn't found a lot of damage in that Thanks, Luciana. So I think we, we have a, one minute, so I'll try to squeeze in one more question here. Um, and this is maybe less of a question, more of an informational point, but it's a question that's been coming up quite often. And so Ricardo Capa is asking if it's possible to share the time histories um, from both of the earthquakes in Mexico. So maybe, Luciano, you can comment how people can access the, the ground motion recordings from the earthquakes. Yeah. Uh, one the the largest um, the largest um, network of of stations is the one from Ceres. So if you go to the Ceres page, that it's c e i r e s dot org, you can ask them for the records. So you can you have to register in in the website and you can ask for the records. And for the records of the UNAM. I believe that you have to ask directly by email to Professor Leonardo Ramirez, and you can find the the, the his um, email on the website of the UNAM uh, Institute of Engineering, and you can you can ask him directly. So th those are the both uh, mainly places that they can have the records. Thanks, Luciano. And we, in a follow-up email, we can share some of the links to the sites that Luciano was referring to. Um, and so quickly before we end, Tara has a few more comments on um, performance of bridges. Mm, th thank you, Maggie. Um, since I, I'm aware we had a few people look at bridges, I could follow up on um, the question that um, originally was asked of Erica. Um, the gear team, Mark Yashinsky was on our advanced team and visited a number of bridge sites. Um, there was a bridge um, in Cuernavaca that collapsed. Um, it was it was quickly it was quickly um, let's say demolished and um, and a new bridge in place by the time our advanced team had arrived. There was a smaller bridge in the state of Puebla that saw a um, a two lane two-lane bridge that saw um, an embankment failure. And there were a number of minor, let's say, abutment movement issues in various bridges across CDMX. But my understanding is that the bridge infrastructure performed um, relatively well and offered functionality uh, uh, for the transportation network following following the, the event. That, that's about all I, I know, Maggie, <laughs> on the bridge issue. Thanks, Tara. So just before ending, I just want to um, show again the link to the um, virtual earthquake clearinghouse site that has more information um, on the earthquake, any reports, photos, data that ERI is aware of is being posted on this site. So it's, it's a growing um, resource for information on the earthquake. Um, there will be PDHs available after this webinar and instructions will be sent out in a follow-up email. Um, if you'd like more information about the EERI Learning from Earthquakes program, um, it's eeri.org slash LFE. Um, and I'd just like to end by thanking all of our speakers, Gilberto, Lucy, Luciano, Tara, Richard, and Erica, for all the work they put into bringing this webinar together. Um, thanks to everyone for participating. I'd also like to thank FEMA for their support of EERI's webinar programming. Um, we hope you enjoyed the webinar. Thank you, everyone.